Uh, thank you, Betty, and thank you all for being here on a uh, Friday night. It's delightful. It's delightful to be together. And I also want to tell you on Sunday mornings on Facebook and on YouTube, we have worship services. They always begin with the release of the sheep. They go from the barn out to the field uh, to have their breakfast as we gather in community to also be nourished. So come join us if you can. And um, so uh, thank you, John, so much for being here. Betty is absolutely right. Um, I heard you on that Wednesday night when you uh, were able to speak on, uh, I believe the title of the topic was Eucharist Upstairs, Yoga Downstairs. And I know it was the start of your good work um, uh, that has uh, been uh, come to fruition in your book, Circling the Elephant, uh, Comparative Theology of Religious Diversity, also just published um, this last spring. So congratulations on the completion of that book. I know you have uh, other excellent uh, books and writings out there. Uh, John ha is now Associate Professor of Theology and World Religions at Union Theological Seminary uh, in New York City. He splits his time between New York City and uh, Vancouver uh, as he travels uh, to be with his wife and then also uh, spends time in New York teaching. Um, oh, I, I have the other book, the title of the other book right here, The Eminent Divine, God, Creation, and the human predicament and east-west conversation. You hear from that, that comparative theology of religion and that diversity um, energy that John brings to every conversation. He is an Episcopalian, uh, but he also uh, draws uh, meaning and spirituality from, uh, as he studies the Advaita Vedanta and Tibetan Buddhist traditions, both academically and I would say spiritually, personally. Committed to seeking interreligious wisdom through multiple religious participation. The work of taking up the practices of and learning from the insights of other religious traditions. Past president of the North American Paul Tillich Society also, and the first chair of the American Academy of Religions Theological Education Committee. So, uh, John, I want to welcome you to this forum, and I also just want us to take a minute to center ourselves in this conversation, because as Betty said, we're moving um, in a theological way into a profoundly personal conversation, and anyone uh, who's uh, studied theology uh, knows how those blend together. I've heard you tell the story of Paul Tillich's um, suffering that led uh, and is grounded in his theology. And so thank you for being here and thank you for being in this space telling us about your joy and your sorrow. Let's just take a deep breath in. All of you who are here together, we'll just breathe together in and out together as we open ourselves to all this joy, to all this promise, to all this sorrow, to all this pain, such is life, mm. such is being, such is spirit, such is love. Amen. Thank you, John. Take us, take us into your journey. Thank you. It's so good to be back with the UC, UCC community again. Uh, the lecture, as was just mentioned, that I gave when I was with you in person last time was a basic outline of some core ideas that has become my new book. So I want to thank you for playing a role in the formation of those ideas. I'm also glad that through social media, I've been able to stay connected to several of you from the community. That's been a special joy um, because I can uh, on Facebook see things like Pastor Catherine's farm animals and those uh, incredibly adorable baby lambs. So I get a window into, uh, into the lives of uh, several of you in that community and that's, that is a great joy. So I'm glad to be back with you again, albeit virtually. And while I'm delighted to be back with you, I must say that I felt and still feel somewhat unsettled 
by the topic of our conversation, all this joy and all this sorrow. I feel pretty certain that I have pursued the life of the intellect because it gives me a kind of safety, a safety that comes from spending my time dwelling largely in thinking rather than feeling, in mind rather than heart. But then you go and invite me to speak on anything but a safe topic. Uh, and far from it, you've, you've asked me to speak to something very intimate, very embodied, and so very close to the heart. So for me, this is unsafe territory, and I, and I blame you all for inviting me to speak in this new way, uh, rather than offer a, a traditional quasi-academic lecture. Uh, I think I should thank you for that, uh, and I'm grateful. But having accepted your invitation, my, my second thought was, well, I know I can speak about sorrow, but I'm not so sure I have much to say in this season about joy. And that's because I spent the first five months of the pandemic inside my New York City apartment. I did not leave my apartment safe to go downstairs to get mail or groceries because I'm in a high risk category because of my asthma. In those months when New York was the global COVID epicenter, I would hear ambulance sirens round the clock and managed to fall asleep sometime around 2 a.m. when even the sirens could not keep me awake any longer. There was simply no way to avoid the, the very intimate nearness of suffering and death. So you see why it's not easy to, to, uh, to, to speak to you about these topics making matters even more challenging. And I don't know that anyone, uh, well, maybe Betty knows this, that I was not spared personal losses in this season either. A dear uncle of mine passed early in the pandemic and my mom died just recently on August 1st. Thankfully, neither died of COVID. I feel certain that my loss and my grief would have been more complicated if, if the cause had been COVID. Although I, I'm not sure I can tell you why that is. But in the case of both immense losses, COVID complicated everything. Having to do Zoom memorials and funeral services meant that my family and I had to grieve without the blessing of extended family. In the case of my uncle, we would have had thousands gathered together because he was a pillar in our Indian Christian community. And my mom, oh, our entire family would have gathered and there would have been hundreds who, who were together in one place, but uh, at least under ordinary circumstances. And under those ordinary circumstances, which I, I deeply miss, I know that each kind embrace would have enabled me to release some measure of sorrow Without those embraces in the rawness of fresh loss, I know that I'm carrying more ungrieved loss than I would under normal circumstances. So all these thoughts came to mind and heart when you asked me to speak about all this joy, all this sorrow. And I wondered what I might share with you tonight Bearing all this, including my own personal uh, grief in mind, I went for a long walk the other day. I thought it might do me some good and generate some way to begin our conversation. As luck would have it, only a single sentence came to mind in an hour and a half of walking. Sometimes writing and thinking is just like that. That one sentence was this, you cannot grieve what you do not love. You cannot grieve what you do not love. I'm not sure why the sentence came to me in the negative, 
I suppose it could have come in the following form. You can only grieve what you truly love. And the positive formulation works too. I think it has profound meaning. But I think the negative formulation came to me because it offered me a warning. I think I was being told that there is a cost, a tremendous cost in seeking to avoid grief. The weight of grief may be heavy and hard to bear, but when we seek to do without it, we diminish ourselves. An expansive heart that loves much will necessarily grieve much. By contrast, a heart that seeks to avoid grief will eventually turn in on itself and shut itself down. Seeking to avoid grief, it will anesthetize itself and become numb. The full breadth and amplitude of the heart's reach will shrink and the heart's vast capacities will atrophy. So the question for us, I think the, the question that came to me in those words is not how can we avoid grief, but rather how can we expand our capacity for holding grief? I hope we can talk about that question this evening. But before I turn to that question, I do want to say first that there is a gospel in our grieving. Every grief is a sacrament of love. Every grief is a sacrament of love. What is perhaps so extraordinary about this time and this season of immense grief and sorrow is that so very many of us are coming to see that we hold in our hearts so very many powerful loves, loves that we sometimes fail to name or even to recognize. Many of us now find ourselves grieving what we once took for granted, and so we did not know that we even loved. Grief is now becoming for us a tutor who teaches us the depth and breadth of our many loves. In these pandemic days, we miss and grieve the togetherness we had with strangers, acquaintances, and friends when we were able to be together with each other at restaurants, at movie theaters, at lecture halls, and at churches. We miss seeing faces now hidden behind masks. Though I must say that I love the way our eyes crinkle up when we smile behind our masks. Our smiles are now in our eyes and we are beginning to know how to recognize them there. This grief we feel in our enforced isolation is teaching us afresh that we are profoundly social beings who truly need each other. We need and miss physical contact. So we learn af afresh how much touch means to us, how very much we need a steady diet of hugs to keep us human and humane. Here uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, we are able to go to restaurants, although we are seated at some distance from each other. The other day, as we were about to walk inside a restaurant lunch gathering to celebrate my mother-in-law's 75th birthday, I saw two women saying goodbye after their lunch. It was clear that they had not seen each other in months. They spoke so tenderly about how very much they missed each other. And then to my great surprise, they leaned against each other while facing away from each other. They were touching each other, but back to back because they missed each other so much and they missed physical contact. So they improvised. I cannot tell you how much joy it brought me to see that. We are learning in this time of enforced distancing something about who we are and what we need. 
our grief about touch deprivation is teaching us how teaching us about how very much we long and love to be held. We're coming to see how very much our sorrows are tied up with our joys. I am even learning new words for new griefs, griefs that I didn't even know I had. One of the words I have only recently learned is a coined word called solastalgia, solastalgia. The word was coined by the environmental philosopher Glenn Albrecht, who calls stolastalgia the homesickness you feel at home. What does he mean by that? Well, he invented the word by borrowing from the word nostalgia. But you know that when the, you may know that when the word nostalgia was first invented, it, it had to do with missing your place. It really had to do with place and homesickness more than it did missing a time, a time in the past. So he's, he's working on that old meaning, but making a change. Soul nostalgia for him is connected to the loss of place, but not because we are separated from it. No, it refers to something else. It speaks of the pain we feel when the climate crisis or environmental destruction has so changed where we live that we can no longer recognize our own home. Albrecht writes, I define solastalgia as the pain or distress caused by the ongoing loss of solace and the sense of desolation connected to the present state of one's home and territory. It is the existential and lived experience of negative environmental change, manifest as an attack on one's sense of place. It is characteristically a chronic condition tied to the gradual erosion of identity created by the sense of belonging to a particular loved place and a feeling of distress or psychological desolation about its unwanted transformation. In direct contrast to the dislocated spatial dimensions of traditionally defined nostalgia, so nostalgia is the homesickness you have when you are still located within your home environment. Perhaps now that you, you've heard this word, you are able to recognize that you too have been visited by soul nostalgia. Perhaps you sense it when you feel the wrongness of weather patterns, unseasonable warmth when it ought not to be warm, or the loss you feel when your home is threatened by wildfires or the air shrouded by smoke so you just can't recognize where you are. That's soul nostalgia. Now, you might be thinking, John, I, I didn't need to know the name for a new grief. I mean, this does not help me. I've, I have enough to grieve as it is. But, but nonetheless, perhaps it, it does help. Sometimes it helps to know what you're experiencing if you don't have a word for it. But my point in introducing the word and the larger notion that we are all now bearing an enormous burden of eco grief, ecological grief, perhaps more grief than we care to acknowledge, is again to alert us to the gospel in our grief. Do remember that the word gospel means good news. So what I want to say is that every grief, every grief carries within it some profound bit of good news. Why? Because every single grief teaches us about the depth and breadth of our loves. You only grieve what you truly love. What that means is that every grief teaches us something precious about the depth of our loves. 
To quote the words of the photographer Chris Jordan, grief, we might say sorrow to keep with our theme, sorrow is a felt experience of love for something we are losing or have lost. Grief is a felt experience of love for something we are losing or have lost. To Jordan's insight, I would add the following. We can only love and we can only grieve that to which we are intimately connected. We cannot grieve or feel that we have lost something that was never really ours in the first place. When a friend misplaces his watch, we might grieve for him, but we do not personally grieve his watch. So if we find ourselves surprised by our grieving, that is because we have just discovered some new bond, some belonging that we did not know was ours to begin with. That's the gospel, or that's the good news in grief, in our sorrows. The great surprising and perhaps even unwanted blessing of these last few months is that we find ourselves grieving a great many things and in so doing discovering just how deeply we love and belong to the world. Last year and very early this year in January, before the pandemic, I found myself in grief about the wildfires in Australia. I learned and I am still learning about the immense losses we suffered there. They're literally unthinkable. We learn, for example, that nearly 3 billion animals were killed or displaced during Australia's devastating bushfires of the past year. The World Wildlife, the Worldwide Fund for Nature uh, calls this the worst, one of the worst wildlife disasters in modern history. Mammals, reptiles, birds, and frogs died in the flames or from loss of habitat. 11.46 million hectares, an area comparable to England, was scorched from September to February. A scientist there, Professor Chris Dickman, writes, when you think about nearly 3 billion native animals being in the path of the fires, it's absolutely huge. It's a difficult number to comprehend. It's hard to know how to hold all that grief, all that sorrow. And again, I very much hope that we can talk about that together and learn how to manage this. But I hope you're hearing me that to to feel connected, to feel connected and feel the grief for something that seems on the other side of the planet, you know, is itself a gift, a kind of sacrament. That's what I'm beginning to learn. I'm beginning, again, just beginning to see that, that every suffering is a kind of painful gift that I must nonetheless receive. When I acknowledge my grief, I recognize the intimacy of my connection to what I have lost. Here, I am much helped by the work of the Buddhist thinker, Joanna Macy. I suspect many of you know her work. In her book, World as Lover, World as Self, she writes, and here I'm quoting her, pain for the world is not only natural, it is a necessary component of our healing. As in all organisms, pain has a purpose. It is a warning signal designed to trigger remedial action. It is not to be banished by injections of optimism or sermons on positive thinking. It is to be named and validated as a healthy, normal human response to the situation we find ourselves in. Faced and experienced, its power can be used. 
as the frozen defenses of the psyche thaw, new energies and intelligence are released. And here's the critical sentence. The problem lies not with our pain for the world, but in our repression of it. The problem lies not with our pain for the world, but in our repression of it. That is a koan and a mantra that I hope we can receive and ponder together. I hope we ask ourselves the following kinds of questions. What are the pains we refuse to recognize or perhaps repress? Are we repressing or refusing to feel some kinds of pain and sorrow because we do not want to acknowledge the depth of our connection, our genuine belonging to people and places that we refuse to recognize? In the midst of this pandemic, how have our hearts broken open and so reconnected us to the world? What griefs have we been forced to face that we might otherwise have refused? Frankly, I think that a great many of us, especially those of us who do not live in intimate relationship with our Black friends and Black communities, and in so doing have severed from our consciousness the long legacy of anti-Black racism in this country, many of us were forced to face up to the horrors of white supremacy in the wake of the televised lynching of George Floyd. Being trapped inside our homes and forced to confront our own vulnerability to death, forced to see that we are bound together inseparably as brothers and sisters, we came to confront what many of us prefer not to recognize. Unable to escape, or numb ourselves, we were forced to see. We were forced to see what we did not want to see. And we found ourselves grieving. We found ourselves outraged. And being broken open by our grief, we discovered the depth of our bonds with each other across racial lines. And that grief, that grief inspired belonging and that is what led so very many white Americans in the middle of the pandemic out into the streets for the very first time. You see how grief and pain and sorrow, when acknowledged, open us up into action, into belonging, into community. I'm reminded of the words of my former colleague and friend, James Cohn, my colleague at Union. He writes, what happened to blacks also happened to whites. When whites lynched blacks, they were literally and symbolically lynching themselves, their sons, daughters, cousins, mothers and fathers, and a host of other relatives. Whites may be bad brothers and sisters, murderers of their own black kin, but they are still our sisters and brothers. We are bound together in America by faith and tragedy. All the hatred we have expressed toward one another cannot destroy the profound mutual love and solidarity that flowed deeply between us. A love that empowered blacks to open their arms to receive the many whites who were also empowered by the same love to risk their lives in the black struggle for freedom. No two people in America have had more violent and loving encounters than black and white people. We were made brothers and sisters by the blood of the lynching tree, the blood of sexual union, and the blood of the cross of Jesus. No gulf between blacks and whites is too great to overcome, for our beauty is more enduring than our brutality. What God joined together, no one can tear apart. Joining together, loving together, grieving together. What does all this have to do with joy? And with these words, I, I'll conclude. I think joy comes from full flourishing. 
is what happens to creatures who come fully alive. Joy is not giddiness. It does not require the erasure of our sorrow. On the contrary, those who cannot grieve cannot experience joy. We feel joy when we fully become ourselves. And we fully become ourselves only when we come into the awareness of the depth of our connections to each other, to the world, to nature, to our animal kin, and with, the, with God, the ground of our being. I am who I am only with you and with the world to which we together belong. I can seek to deny that belonging, to attenuate the force of our griefs and our sorrow, but only by cutting off the possibility of flourishing, the possibility of fullness of life, and so the possibility of joy. Thank you. Ah, John, thank you. I uh, just feel like we just need to take, again, another breath uh, and sit with what you have shared with us. First of all, just my heart uh, opens to your heart as you speak of your personal grief. And um, wow, to walk into this topic, carrying what you're carrying and open yourself to us. What a gift. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, and I also have to say, um, to acknowledge grief in this time, um, I, I think it's one of the hardest um, tasks we have because, because acknowledging grief is a hard task, period. Um, I've heard it said that one of the uh, reasons um, that 9-11 plunged us into such, uh, such violence is because we refused to acknowledge our grief. We had no national way of grieving. Within a month, we were responding with violence, with retribution. And we made no space for our grief. And that's, you know, 19 years of, of making no room. Uh, but it's more than 19 years, isn't it? I mean, it's 400 years. It's, it goes all the way back. Um, I'm trying to feel my way to a question because you've brought us into our hearts so deeply. Um, so there are two things that occur to me and I, I don't know which path to take. The first is you said we have to expand our capacity for grief. And I really want to dive in there and say, are there spiritual practices um, that you know of that expands our capacity for grief? Um, the season of Lent came immediately to my mind, that season of intentional um, limiting ourselves to know what matters, to learn what matters most. Um, but I wondered about other spiritual practices. But there's another question that goes right alongside that, and that is the national question, that, that refusal to grieve. And it feels like we've got, we're in the midst of a presidential campaign where one person has told us oh, it's all going to go away. Don't feel what you feel. And another person who knows his, who's walked his own journey of grief and opened that to us has said, it, it, it can get, it might get, it will get, he said, it will get very dark um, before it gets better. And our capacity to grieve and to take that in and to um, not just set it aside, uh, is so limited. There's such, Brueggemann, Walter Brueggemann, theologian Walter Brueggemann, of course, says, says that empire has a vested interest in keeping us numb and keeping us from grieving, right? And distracting us from what we don't have. So that, and, and in that very distraction, distracting us from our joy or our doxology or our praise as well. So maybe I've spoken enough and 
Uh, but you said, you know, the key question is how do we expand our capacity for grief? So, sir, how yeah. do? Well, I mean, I, again, I, I'm, I, I think I'm still a beginner at this. Um, I, perhaps all of us are um, in, in various ways. But, you know, I find that uh, I'm most able to feel my own grief, the grief of my uh, loss of my mother in particular, when I'm, when I'm in worship. And, and that worship has been entirely by Zoom. For goodness sake, you know, I'm still getting moved and, and connected to my own grief because of being together in community by, uh, you know, singing and hearing preaching and participating in liturgy. So there's something about ritual in community that, that provides the matrix you know, a word closely related to mother, you know, <laughs> uh, a, a kind of holding for, um, for grief. So I guess my first, the first part of my answer is that, that uh, no one can, brief, can bear their grief alone. No, it just can't be done, right? That, that, that attempting to grieve in solitude alone. No, the griefs we bear in this age um, particularly the kind of eco grief I've mentioned is just so immense that we need each other to bear uh, to, to bear our burdens. So, uh, so I think that's key. The other thing that comes to mind is that almost all our traditions are trying to teach us that there are depths in us. Uh, that we're not acquainted with. Mm -hmm. um, that the soul bottoms out into the, divin into the divine life. And, and there's more here than me, uh, narrowly speaking. And so I want to ask, what are the practices by which my sense of self as just me, me alone, little old me, <laughs> you know, can, can open out. Um, I think contemplative prayer, practices of stillness, um, Buddhist forms of meditation are, are all about finding a spaciousness within that goes beyond the ego. And that spaciousness can hold so very much. In my own Buddhist practice, uh, one of the things I do is that I'm taught by the tradition, uh, the Tibetan tradition, that my nature is the same as the Buddha's, right? the teaching of Buddha nature. And therefore, my heart is capable of loving as intensely as he did, that, 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 that his compassion, infinite as it is, can be mine because my nature and his are identical. And of course, we Christians say the same thing. It sometimes helps to go find another tradition that points you back to your own home ground. And so we say that we're made in the Im image of God and that we are, um, that God became human so that humans might become God. So there's a kind of capacity for love and for holding both immense joy and immense grief that I think most of us have just begun to tap because we've lost touch with practices that connect us to our own depths, depths that are both ours and then fall off into something that's well beyond us. <laughs> and and I, I think we, we need to reconnect to those practices if we're to bear the pains and sorrows and joys um, of times like this. I, I'm struck by, um, by the invitation that Betty gave me to pray at the beginning of this gathering and uh, knowing that prayer is both a profound practice and can be a troubling practice because it can, it can look like um, I just ask and then everything's okay. Uh, whereas we, ha we also have that, that statement uh, by Paul that, that 
the spirit intercedes with us for us with groans deeper than any words we can find and that kind of prayer um that kind of prayer is the prayer that that takes me to to both of those places to that deepest grief but profoundly uh to the deepest joy as well i mean i i think that Again, I, I want to point to Brueggemann because, uh, or e read any of the Psalms yeah. uh, that, that begin with such despair, uh, but in the end say, thank you, God. Look, look what, look, look what I'm connected to. I guess that's it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Um, when I'm doing the Christian form of contemplative practice, um, the phrase I often use is the phrase Jesus utters on the cross, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And, and periodically throughout the day, um, I'll just say that, you know, uh, not out loud, but mentally. <laughs> um, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And in so doing, I think I'm trying to to practice surrender, uh, practice letting go into a depth that I cannot master, that is not my own, but in which and to which I, 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 I belong. Um, and, and there's a capaciousness there that goes deeper than in a, any self-management technique, <laughs> any self-help technique. Um, it's uh, it's a kind of opening and a release and a surrender into into divine depths. Um, I was I was struck uh, when you told the story of the two women at the restaurant in Victoria. <laughs> Isn't that um, wonderful? Well, uh, just yesterday, our community lost one of our beloved members. Oh. Uh, I might tear up even as I think of her. She was. She was part of my search committee when she was part of the group that brought me here to Seattle. So I, I would, here I am on the island and I get this word and of course I hop on the ferry and I drive to the home um, and I put on my mask and people come out to greet me and I, I wanted to hug them and I knew I couldn't. So here's what we did. We just turned like this, one of us facing this way and one facing the other way. We did that same thing. <laughs> We just leaned on each other yeah. uh, in connection. It was, it was quite a moment. Maybe in this time of isolation, we need to develop and celebrate and name practices like, like that, or even something like you said, Zoom. I can still, I can, I just show up on Zoom and somehow suddenly my grief emerges if I let it. So practices, again, I, I want to say, um, remember to show up in a group, right? Remember to show up somewhere. Remember not to be alone. What else? I think I, I said, remember that perhaps you're capable of more than you know. Yeah, um, it's deeper and, than you realize. Yeah, and that's, again, because the line between you and what is not you, what is beyond you, is murky. <laughs> that's, that's why the Hindu traditions and the Buddhist tradition often speak about non-duality, that word Advaita that you're uh, naming at the beginning. It means non-dual, that the ultimate reality and you are not two. Um, and that's a funny way of putting it. It's a way of saying that it's not just an undifferentiated mush, uh, but but it's not two either. Um, and uh, you know, in, in Christian discourse, we have many ways of saying this. We have ways of saying things like that God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Right? If 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 God is or that God is nearer to me than I am to myself, to quote Augustine. Right. So what are the practices that allow us to fall into that depth? Um, 
trusting that that depth will somehow catch us. catch us, even though the way it catches us might also feel a bit like free fall, right? That, um, that's, it's a, there's a mystery there. It's not a catching that feels without a certain kind of risk. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's always a risk. And, um, uh... Maybe finding the community where you can take that risk and knowing um, and knowing that that catching will might feel different than you expected. But I, I also was struck when you talk, began to talk about the Christian tradition, I thought you might bring up the Trinity. Um, it's part of why I love the Jesus, the Christian story. It's part of where I've, I've found that depth, the Celtic knot. The, the God is one and God is many. Uh, Bob Fitzgerald, for whom these lectures are named, he used to say, why stop at three? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in the Christian tradition, that, that insistence that there is, there's an interconnection, that a Trinity can't be dual, dualistic, right? We can't be bifurcated in that way. It, it somehow has to uh, move together. So are there other traditions or other ways of talking about this, both grief and, and joy from other traditions that, that can feed us? No, um, what I find myself wanting to talk about is, uh, again, a, a sense of, of learning that um, we have to cultivate our loves, that one of the things I'm learning from these other traditions is that um, we sometimes in the West think of love as wholly spontaneous. Like it's just there or not there. <laughs> and if it's not there, yeah, what can you do? You know, and you throw up your hands. But the traditions that I spend my time studying actually say, that you have to work on deepening what your loves. And that, so part of what, uh, what one does in various forms of contemplations is practice expanding the reach of the heart. So it's very standard practice in Buddhist traditions to do a kind of, yeah, hold on, I'll hold on. <laughs> There's a pooch emergency. Talk it's about just the dogs, the, the sheep are, are out there and the dogs were going crazy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's beautiful. Now, uh, so one of the practices that, uh, that I do um, at, at, at my best daily is to imagine myself in front of someone who deeply loves me. Um, for me, this is almost always begins with my daughter. Um, you know, who, who just adores me. Uh, she might get embarrassed if she sees this later, but, but I just feel it, right? She just, she just beams at me. And when she says, Papa, I melt, right? So I expose myself to that kind of intensity of affection and then call to mind other people who love me this way. Uh, my teachers, uh, spiritual mentors, uh, and, and then sort of practice irradiating myself <laughs> with their very real love for me. And as I bask in it, I then turn to extending my love first to people who I find it easy to love. You know, uh, it could be the dog, you know? There's just nothing in you that uh, has any barrier, right? It just opens up to your pet beautifully. And so, your heart, you can practice that. But then you sort of practice with people who are kind of strangers, someone you might run across daily who, you know, gives you your coffee at your local Seattle, you know, elite coffee establishment. And, and this person is not someone who you have any deep connection with, but you envision extending the love that you've just received to that person and then Buddhist practices challenge you to expand to a challenging or difficult person. 
Uh, and you don't have to go all the way to the most difficult person because uh, then it won't be organic. You practice expanding the reach of your love for a difficult person who annoys you, but, but doesn't necessarily push your last button. Right? What's the point of this practice, right? Practices like this suggest to us, to me anyway, that we can, as I said, cultivate and practice and expand our capacities for love. Um, and, and in so doing, open up the heart to its full natural amplitude, right? So it's not that we're forcing the heart to do something it, it, it just isn't made to do. The tradition, and I think ours does too, right? Uh, we're called to love neighbor and enemy alike, right? Our traditions say our hearts are ginormous, that they have infinite capacity. It sounds ridiculous to say that this puny little heart has infinite capacity. But that's literally what every tradition I train and practice and teach and read in teaches me. And, uh, and if that weren't so, all that I said this evening about our capacity to bear grief and pain uh, and, and open up into our connection to each other would just be a fantasy story. I would be saying that we should do things we're not capable of. Right, but right. Our but, but our traditions say we are capable of it. And that's why our traditions matter. They tell us these ridiculous things that we're capable of. <laughs> uh, and because again, we bottom out into the divine. I love that, I, but I and I also love the the word practice, um, uh, because I think all spiritualities have a practice, and and uh, what that means is there are times when you're doing it just because it's your practice, That's it's not because it paid off. I mean, I show up at worship, and uh, twenty times I don't cry, for example, right. but the time, but I'll never forget. That time I walked into that worship service and that preacher started going and all of a sudden I was crying and I didn't even know why. And I still remember there I was in a, surrounded by people who cared about me, just crying through the service. And um, it had nothing to do even necessarily with what he was preaching about, except maybe one line he said. But because I came the other 20 times, finally I was there when that moment came. I couldn't control it. I can't control it, but I can regularly put myself in those places where spirit shows up. It's, it's part of why I love my commute across the water. I, it's not every time I cross the water that I touch the sacred, but boy, some mornings I'll see an orca or some mornings I'll just see the light on the water yeah. and no uh, something of and my, and those those divisions can di can dissolve, or the pr the practice. I mean, that's kind of what my book is about. It's about the practice of getting up every morning and and feeding a flock of sheep and the very f physical piece. And maybe that's part of what we could talk about too, because um, we've been talking about embodiment. That very physical piece of just picking up the hay and taking it out to the sheep and no one. Uh, but a wise shepherd 30 years ago said, the animals eat first and then you eat. Because if you don't feed them, they don't eat. And mm -hmm. I've, I've never forgotten that. So now I'm in a place where I don't just remember it up here. You know, I remember it in my body. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's why you know, it, it makes sense to sit down, for me anyway, cross-legged uh, on, on the uh, meditation cushion and, and show up. Uh, I should be doing it even more than I do. <laughs> but when I'm doing it, and, and because I'm doing it even, even as intermittently as I, I do, some other possibility and longing is opening up in me. Uh, I, I have this sort of intimation that every moment might be a sacrament. Um, and, and I'm finding myself noticing things like, 
dude, man, your addiction to your device is interfering with this, right? This, these, these contraptions we carry along with us and our compulsions to check them are, are I'm getting more annoyed by them because, because I'm tasting something else emerging when you know, I'm walking to the bus uh, or, or, or washing the dishes. A, a sense that there's a presence here that's, that's larger and, and, and uh, I wanna say hosting me almost and that I could drop into that and it, you know, but, but I, it won't happen. It, and, and it's even the taste of it, the kind of longing for it is only emerging, I think, because I am sitting my posterior down <laughs> on the cushion and it, yeah. So I, I don't know what I'm gonna do about the, the phone addiction, but at least the fact that it's becoming uh, more annoying to me that I have it is, is a kind of sense, a kind of awakening to the possibility of a, another kind of connection. It, it makes me wonder, and, and I also, I know we've got about 70 people out there, uh, every one of them who have had a journey with grief, yeah. uh, every one of them who uh, in this COVID time perhaps has either developed a practice or lost a practice or wondering what their practice might be and I'm eager to I'm eager to get that dialogue kind of broadened out but before we do that I just have one more question or thought reflection um, we're kind of talking about personal um, personal griefs and I, and I, if we touch briefly on um, national uh, grief or international grief. I, I loved, um, well loved and uh, was very aware of the pain of that, of that word solastalgia, um, the loss of solace. Um, culturally, it feels like we've, we've lost, we've not just lost our environment, uh, culturally we've lost the capacity to grieve, to, to look at death. And I think that denial uh, has been so costly that it could cost us uh, all of creation because it's, I think it's that denial of grief that turns us into mindless consumers or, or addicts us to our phones. Or, um, so how do we help this culture expand its capacity to grieve and to face and to, to speak truth instead of, instead of those uh, kind of nice, uh, you know, it's all going to be okay, it's all going to go away, um, just get through it, or, or whatever lies we're telling ourselves. Or, you know, the lie of U.S. history, that, 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 the lie of white supremacy, um, the lie of uh, a nation that was founded on freedom uh, when we're discovering or we've known all along and denied that it, it was not at all. Yeah, and that's, that's why I wanted to talk about uh, and, and mentioned uh, James Cone and, yeah. and the murder of Mr. Floyd. We're talking about personal and political issues at the same time because we're talking about our capacity to be connected and to honor all our creation. I mean, all our... Uh, all our relatives to use the, all our relations to use indigenous terms, right? Um, and Cohen's and terms too, right? He said the same thing. That's yeah. That's the thing. That's yeah. right. And, and so, uh, you know, what, <laughs> you know, your question has prompted me to realize something that, that uh, I was thinking about this just a couple of days ago. I, I'm not sure what prompted it, but I, I found myself over the last two or three days, um, actually maybe more than that, haunted by um, what happened on Fox News in 2003, I think, when Mr. Rogers died. Uh, that news station held a number of sort of episodes in which they accused Mr. Rogers of being an evil, evil man. Mr. Rogers, for crying out loud. And, oh. 
And, and the, their argument was that he was telling children that they were special without having to do anything, you know, without having to work, without having to like, you know, uh, put in, you know, the good old college tr try, that they were just as they were. And so we generated a, uh, a generation of young people who just think too well of themselves, apparently. And <laughs> this is why he was an evil, evil man. I think I'm haunted by that because, because, because it told me long before the c current craziness where we were headed, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was a, 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 uh, a media channel whose entire purpose is to, in some ways, corrode our capacities for connection. Yeah. And once you corrode our, your, you know, our national capacities to be connected across racial lines, across political lines, uh, when those capacities corrode, then the body populace is ready for somebody offering false community, false consolation, right? Rather than genuine belonging, somebody says, I will bring you belonging, but at the expense of some other. Right. Who is the enemy, right? Yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's a deep longing. It's a genuine longing, this longing to uh, have connection. And, and, and if you fragment genuine connection, you can uh, then mobilize pseudo connection. Well, right there might be a great a place for us to take a break, to again, take a deep breath. I just want to say pastorally, I, I honor um, the pain of the stories um, of the faces I can't see right now. And, uh, and if you're carrying that pain or if um, as, the, as you recognize your own griefs, please know this community is here for you. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm just going to turn it over to whoever's going to take us into our break. Betty. So Catherine, um, that was a joyful interlude. And for those folks who don't know in the audience, those were our youth members and who sang that song for our youth service on May 31st. So what a joy that was to hear again and how fitting it was, I think, for the conversation. Um, but I'm going to turn this back over to you. There are a number of questions in the chat. Have you... I'm hoping you had a chance to look at those. Maybe we can begin the conversation. You know, I looked, I, I, as I looked through the uh, questions, um, just one theme struck me, um, and that is the level of suffering and um, the tendency when you begin to talk about grief um, to think that um, naming it can be dismissing it or name it, naming naming grief and then suggesting there's something else going on can be saying things like, well, that grief is okay. And so I just, I, I want to clarify, I'm, I'm never saying that that grief, that it's just, it, it's very hard to talk about grief without it feeling like someone is saying, here's how you move beyond it, instead of saying, here's how you feel it, embrace it and in some ways kind of survive that pain. But I think maybe more importantly, let yourself be transformed by that pain into something more. So John, I'm wondering if, if you pick that up in those questions and if yeah, you say yeah. something about that. Uh, and there are, uh, I mean, we're dealing with very deep stuff that isn't just conceptually deep, but it, it has to do with un unearthing layers of self and soul, right? Right. There's, there's also a way of speaking about suffering and grief that, that might valorize it. Um, I mean, part of what we're saying is that it is, it is a pain, it is a rupture that we feel, and, and, and we're not celebrating um, those ruptures or those violations, and, and some of those are inflicted on people against their will, right? So, um, so we don't want to sort of romanticize suffering either. So there's a number of problems to be avoided in, in how we talk about grief um, that, that I think we have to be extremely careful about. I think all I was trying to say 
and I think a number of wisdom traditions are saying, is that grief can be a doorway. Uh, and if skillfully navigated. And, and the other point is, if you repress it, it will come back in some deeply painful and, and wounding way. Um, and so there's no bypassing it, there's no repressing it, there's no avoiding it. It, it has to be, when it comes, uh, faced. And, and that's different from saying, well, let's celebrate it or, or you know. Uh, or move through it, or even here are the three things you can do to, to get past it quickly. Here are the five stages you'll right. go through as if it's some kind of linear process that, doesn't, that you don't circle back to. I mean, when John uh, contacted me, told me a little bit about what he was gonna be sharing, um, I began talking about a 30-year-old grief. Um, and instantly I can access that in a way that, that reminds me of what I lost, that I, that I still grieve. Uh, but this, at the same time, uh, that, that time put me so in touch with the reality of life that, um, that my, my own life is richer and deeper and uh, incredibly more meaningful than it would be if I just never grieved. Right, uh, and that's a, you know, goes to a question that was just posed. How do we, how do we grieve well? Uh, and I think we're just, we're just kind of sensing our way into that, right? Don't avoid it, don't lie about it, don't evade it. Uh, I think all, all of that, um, and then practice with it. Know that there is a space in you that, that can hold it um, if you deepen into that space. And then, of course, you know, you're talking about the national grief. We have lost uh, 220,000 uh, precious lives in this country at a minimum. The excess count is actually already at 300,000. Um, and, and that's an immense immense grief and we have had no national recognition, N not a single sort of national mourning. Uh, you know, we, we keep doing so for 9-11 um, every year, but, but somehow this grief is, is, is not to be named, it's not to be touched, it's not to be seen. We're supposed to just snap our fingers and go through it. Well, that's not doing grief well, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, I think our cap if grief is done well, whatever that means, whatever that means, you will know it by an enlargement of your capacity for empathy. Mm. That, that, well, that let me let me just say uh, that brings uh, some a, a very specific question by Lois and Lois, thank you for this question. How about individual responsibility in the historical? suffering of blacks and people of color. I struggle to imagine that it is George Floyd that brought to light the suffering of blacks or people of color, uh, she says, and then I lost the rest of that statement, but it, but uh, um, cause, just because of my inadequacy with technology, but there it is. Um, what was it about uh, George Floyd that brought people to this place or, or I'm sorry, Lois, I didn't, I lost the rest of your question. Go ahead, John. Well, it's a, it's a deep question. I, I, I do think something happened that, that did bring in particular whites to a kind of greater consciousness, um, certainly judging by the numbers of people who for the first time joined marches across the country and indeed across the planet. So something did happen. Uh, that seems significant. And my best guess about that in my remarks is that it had to do with the fact that many of us were locked down and in intensely aware of our own mortality uh, under the threat of COVID. So there was a way in which perhaps we were more, we were sort of poised to be open to seeing our connections with each other across racial lines precisely because we were in a kind of fragility 
uh, enforced fragility that reminded us, hey, you know, you could die too. Uh, and and just, just in that space, there might have been a slight opening towards seeing what, of course, is almost a, a constant litany of, of Black people being killed by police officers. I mean, that happens, uh, what is it, every 28 hours, I believe. Um, so it's not as though we needed to see that. Many, many minority communities know, Black folks in particular, that uh, this is not news. Uh, but, but some of us, at least, were broken open in a new way. Uh, and and I, I think I'm calling us to sort of move into that to move into that space of, uh, of finding our connections with each other rather than refusing them by, by means of white supremacy. Yeah, yeah, uh, that the, the white supremacy myth of separation. Yeah. And separation and then ranking as opposed to uh, deep connection. Yeah. So, so uh, John Schaefer, says, this conversation gets me in touch with the grief of lost environmental battles, fracking, North Slope oil drilling in Alaska, pebble mine development that endangers the Bristol Bay fishery, also in Alaska. Nothing is okay about any of these issues. Yeah. And, and we've, they finally emerged in this last debate. And, uh, and you know, in po possibly about as important an issue, you know, in the last few minutes of the last debate. And, and then too, I think many of us found ourselves holding our breath because uh, Joe Biden actually went ahead and said, you know, we have to stop. We have to stop. We have to stop fossil fuel. And, and, and it was as though, you know, a presidential candidate finally said what, what absolutely has to be said, uh, that, that it does have to stop and we do have to transition away. And, you know, I don't, did you feel a certain like, oh my God, maybe he's going to lose Pennsylvania uh, <laughs> as a result of, of, uh, of having said something that was true? That's it. That's it. It's right there. It's, it's so... So it's, again, I'm going to take us right back to that refusal to grieve. The, the refusal to say this, we have to let go of this. This, this is dead, and this is a dead path. Uh, same thing with white supremacy. It's, it's a refusal to say this is dead, to acknowledge the deadness of something and, and let it go. It's like... Um, the zombie myth, right? Uh, we live, we live with zombie energy policies. I'll just say, we live with zombie supremacy images, and there's nothing but death there. But we we walk around pretending that there's life there, and it's death. And when somebody names it, it's almost as if um, they become dead to us too. So that holding our breath sense. Uh oh, is somebody going to tell the truth and let us grieve? Wow. Betty, are you jumping back in here? I am. It's so hard to do that. There is so much to follow up on. I just, before we bring this to the, a close, and we have to in the next couple minutes, <laughs> I want to follow up with something that John said a moment ago, which was part of this year, what has, what has broken some of us open is because we too were scared. It, I said this last week, but it was on April, I think, 5th. It was Palm Sunday service, and it was very early in the pandemic. And that's when our church choir, in a very early Zoom musical moment, sang the John Denver song, All This mm. Joy, All This Sorrow. And I was sitting here at home on my couch, feeling all alone and feeling scared. And I'm a privileged white woman, and I don't feel scared very often. And I think this pandemic has thrown us into a place that has so separated us from our normalness that we are finally open to some of the grief of the world. And it has been a year that's, that's, for me, that's where the transformation has come from, is when I am broken open. And I and those parts of my life that usually are just on some 
you know, fast track or whatever. This year has cracked that open for me. And so that is a great sorrow. And yet it is where the joy comes from. But the power of denialism shouldn't be underestimated here, right? Because there are people who, who want to insist, I am invulnerable. Right. I don't need no freaking mask. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, right. the whole culture of, and, it, and I feel a deep sense of loss and pain there, right? Because right. there are folks who say, who don't want to acknowledge their fragility. And so are, are going to just sort of defy it and pretend uh, I'm invulnerable. Uh, you may be vulnerable, but not me. Not me. And, Let me, yeah. Betty, I know we've got to leave. Let me just say one more pastoral word again. I know we've, we've waded into deep water. And uh, let's open our hearts to one another. Give one another the grace of whatever, whatever this, the, this deep water has led us to. And if you feel overwhelmed and if you feel alone, I'm just going to put this invitation out there. Um, go to uh, University UCC. Send an email. Uh, send an email to me. Let me know that you're out there, and um, and I'll reach out and we'll bump shoulders or we'll reach across and hold hands. Um, I'll hear your story. Um, blessings to you. Thank you all uh, who were willing to take this journey with us tonight. Thank you. And John, ah, oh, thank you very much for your willingness also. And Betty. And Catherine, thank you. And I wanted to especially thank John. You opened this lecture by saying <clears throat> we invited you to go into a hard place. Yes, you did. <laughs> and I know that particularly because of your personal losses in recent months. And so, which is the other message of this moment, which is the vulnerability comes when we move from our head to our heart, right? It's, I, I too like to hang out in my head and we have to move that into our heart. And you were willing to do that with us tonight. Thank you. And by doing that with us, I mean, we, we brought this audience there. And I hear, Catherine, that, you know, we are leaving in a tender place. So, um, uh, you know, we have to figure out what to do with that. But know that you are being held by all of us. Um, I am left with one thing that you said, uh, which is uh, beauty is more enduring than brutality. Yeah, that was beautiful. And so as we enter these next 11 unknown days and the days that follow, and you know, all those, all those days that go after that, I'm going to remember that beauty is more enduring than brutality and uh, to keep, keep myself open. So thank you, John, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Catherine, for being with us tonight. Thank you, audience, for being with us tonight. I want to just show these two wonderful books. These are great books. I've read them both. <laughs> They're great. We're sheep and elephants. We're talking yeah. animals tonight. Yeah. I like that. So remember to vote. I suspect I'm um, preaching to the choir when I say that, but uh, remind your friends and your neighbors and uh, everybody else to vote. Uh, yeah, Catherine's got hers right there. Um, come back and worship with us on Sunday morning at 10. Come back uh, next week and listen to another story of uh, this wild and a uh, crazy year of 2020 and what Reverend Yolanda Norton is doing to touch a lot of lives as well. So uh, with that, I think we will bring this to an end. I want to thank again our tech team that's been in the background. If you guys want to show yourself again, uh, you've done a remarkable job a couple, a couple of weeks in a row now. Yay. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Come back next week. And um, again, blessings for the night to everybody. You will be in my prayers. Thank you. <laughs>